Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nala Karij Nungamot, Kain Kadit Nijabuja. We acknowledge the Nungar people as the original custodians of this land. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We are a temple to God, the body of Christ, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Yet we have not lived in the light of this glory to which we are called in Jesus. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Bountiful God, to whose glory we celebrate the dedication of this house of worship, we praise you for the many blessings you have given to those who worship here. And we pray that all who seek you in this place may find you. And being filled with the Holy Spirit, may become a living temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Kings. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart, the covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house, the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays towards this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place, O here in heaven, your dwelling place. Heed and forgive. Hear the word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, 
Let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believed, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they are destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built a, 
built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of God within, amongst and beyond us, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Often in a passage of scripture, or in a novel, or in conversation, one word or phrase will leap out at you and demand your attention, especially when we read or listen reflectively. And that was the case for me when I read through the reading set for today's Feast of Dedication. It is a familiar word used frequently in our liturgy. We often read about it in the Bible, especially the New Testament, where it is taught as a crucial part in all of our relationships, yet one we don't always put into practice because we find it difficult. What helped to bring it to my attention in our Old Testament reading was its placement. Right at the end of today's portion of King Solomon's prayer of dedication of the temple, King Solomon pleading with God to hear the prayers being offered and forgive. Forgive what? And why does Solomon plunge his people, and we today, into a state of remorse and compunction on such a joyful and celebratory occasion in this wonderful building dedicated to God's glory. And today, remembering and giving thanks to God for those visionaries and the skilled craftsmen and women who brought St George's Cathedral Perth into completion. Why plead for forgiveness? Because Solomon knew, as our forebears knew, as you and I know, that we have failed in the past and we will fail again in the future to live as we have promised we will. And we have already confessed to God our failure to live as compassionately, as fully as our faith calls us to. And we know even as we begin afresh with the assurance of God's absolution that we will again let down ourselves, our God, our loved ones, and our neighbor. 
Even that model of idyllic kingship, King David, fell from grace. And his son Solomon, revered for his wisdom and magnificence, succumbed later in his reign to worshipping idols, sowing the seeds for later division of the kingdom to the detriment and the suffering of ordinary people. Then, as well as now, leadership requires prudence, integrity, faithfulness to a greater good, and transparency. And we have a right and a duty to require of our leaders and alternative leaders, as well as of ourselves, accountability and a commitment to the common good above our own personal interests. Sadly, we are all very good in justifying the choices we make, especially when they are in our own interests. And our so-called one little weakness multiplies the more we succumb. The scriptures remind us time and time again, and history shows it, that when what is less than noble, that which is less than for the common good, that which withholds or ignores justice for the least amongst us, then human society slowly breaks down. We are all damaged. No man is an island sufficient unto himself, wrote John Donne. The expectations we have of secular government, of our beloved Anglican Church, the expectations we have of ourselves are rarely fully realised. At least that's my experience. It's what we do with that experience that makes all the difference. The Benedictine Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, Basil Hume, learned just two months before his subsequent death that he had a terminal and aggressive cancer. On hearing the prognosis, his initial response was, if only I could start all over again, I would be a much better monk, a much better bishop. But then thought, how much better it would be if I could come before God when I die, not to say, thank you, God, that I was such a good monk, thank you that I was such a good bishop, but rather, God, be merciful to me. For if I come empty-handed, then I will be ready to receive God's gift. Reality is essential if we are to live and celebrate with integrity. Which is why we Anglicans in public worship as well as in personal devotions are exhorted to examine our conscience to be honest when we miss the mark, calling to mind and bringing before God all that we need to confess. And our confession will sometimes include national or institutional acts of shame, even though we may not have been personally involved. We are all part of the main. In his book on prayer, Our Deepest Longing, Ronald Rollheiser says, disillusionment is a good thing. It's the dispelling of an illusion. As long as our questioning and seeking continue, disillusionment is a sign of a maturing faith. And Solomon was under no illusion in pleading for God to hear the people's prayer and to forgive. It is a sign that they recognised that they needed help. Needed help not to make the same mistakes of unfaithfulness and idolatry. And that recognition, as is our recognition of our mistakes and our shortcomings, that is a cause for celebration. A cause for celebration and rejoicing as we open up our hearts to God, this steadfast God, 
who is the rock to which we can cling and against which we can kick. There is a certain ambiguity in those opening words of the foreword by the Dean Emeritus, Dr. John Shepherd, of Professor John Tonkin's history of this cathedral. He says, few histories of cathedrals live up to expectations. Is it that this written history does not cover everything that has happened in and around and from this building? Or has this place and its people and we today, have we not and do we not fulfill the hopes, the vision, which scripture, compassion, justice, peace and unity calls us to commit to? I believe it is the latter because Dr. Shepherd goes on to say that the author invites us to consider the character of the cathedral, its soul. And it's not for this blow in from the East to make a judgment on the inner spiritual health of those who have gone before us, of those who form our cathedral community today, or even of the silent witness and effect this structure has had upon the life of this city. Perhaps not even those of us who have been here a long time can adequately assess that influence. Hopefully though, that has been for the good, for the spiritual and cultural enrichment of the city. As the prophet Jeremiah pleaded long ago for God's people who were in exile at the time to not lament their limitations, their constraints, where they were placed, but to seek the welfare of the city, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And Jeremiah was not referring to economic prosperity and security, but to that inner life of the spirit, the soul of the place, of the person. In our case, the inner life nourished and enriched by liturgy, reverently led and engaged in music which lifts our spirits, preaching which comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable, in the hospitality of inclusion, in doors open providing a quiet space of refuge, and in prayer, in prayer by a regular discipline of faithfully coming before God in the poverty of our desire, thirsting for the good of others as well as for ourselves. It is to seek God within, around and yet still beyond us, beckoning us to be better than we presently are, to make those changes in our thinking, in our behaviour, that free us from the shackles of the past, free us from prejudice, free us from the mistakes or the reckless behaviour of our earlier years, free us to offer our best as best we can, yet still knowing that we are here to be rebuilt, reshaped, reformed into spiritual beings who, as George MacDonald, writer and friend of C.S. Lewis says, spiritual beings who happen to have a body. We are here to kneel or sit, depending on our age, to kneel where prayer has been valid. To use some words of T.S. Eliot. And to continue, to, to continue that stream of prayer and of living prayerfully. We are here to learn to live out in our daily lives that seemingly foolish claim that the self-giving love that shaped the life of our Lord lies at the creative heart of the universe. We are here to learn and trust in the fulfilment that comes from sacrificial living and committing ourselves to our own growth. And it is for this and to this that this building, this church, you and me are dedicated, building on that sure foundation in Jesus Christ, 
giving thanks for all that has been, for all that is, and for all that will be, knowing that God's steadfast love endures forever. Two weeks ago in his presentation at the Cathedral Spirituality Day, Father Frank Sheehan said that ethics is basically being helpful, similar to what the mystic Rusbrook said in the 14th century. Be kind, be kind, and you will be saints. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified, Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. United in the company of all the faithful, and looking for the coming of the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, let us offer our prayers to God, the source of all life and holiness. Merciful Lord, strengthen all Christian people by your Holy Spirit, that we may live as a royal priesthood and a holy nation to the praise of Jesus Christ our Saviour. We pray for this Cathedral Church of St. George on the 133rd anniversary of its dedication for all who work and worship here, especially for myself and for my family and for our whole cathedral community. We pray for this place that we may be still and know that you are God, for the fulfilling of our desires and petitions as you see best for us and for your blessings in the past and for a vision for the future. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the church universal of which these buildings are a visible symbol. We pray for Kay, our Archbishop, for Bishops Jeremy and Kate. We pray also for Archbishop Geoffrey of Adelaide, Primate of Australia, Bishop Christopher of our partner Diocese of Eldoret in Kenya, and Archbishop Justin of Canterbury. Bless all ministers of your church, that by faithful proclamation of your word, we may be built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets into a holy temple in the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray for a world recovering from pandemic, for those places where infections are increasing, for those places where medical resources are scarce, for those who are separated from family and dear friends, for tired medical professionals working for the good of others. We pray that vaccines and treatments will be readily available to all who need them. Give to the world and its peoples the peace that comes from above, that they may find Christ's way of freedom and life, Lord, in your mercy. Bless the aged and infirm, sick and suffering, especially remembering Darren, Miller, Percy, Daryl, Adrienne, Ibrahim, Safar, Marianne, Lachlan, Shay, Ashley and Brad, and all those who are on our hearts today. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Remember in your mercy all those gone before us who have been well-pleasing to you from eternity. Remember Colin Creeley and Jim Chataway, recently departed, and Ida Thurgood, Alistair Inglis, Dolly Moss, Geoffrey Gates, and Bertie Newman on this their year's mind. Remember those who built this house of prayer. Henry Parry, the second Bishop of Perth, Joseph Gregg and Frederick Goldsmith, the third and fourth deans of Perth, and Edmund Blackett, the architect. And remember all who have worshipped in this place. We give you thanks for St. George and the whole company of your saints in glory, with whom in fellowship we join our prayers and praises. By your grace, may we, like them, be made whole in your love. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive. Through Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ. The, the peace of the Lord be always with you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Oh, glory and honor be yours always and everywhere, mighty Creator, ever living God. We give you thanks and praise for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained eternal deliverance for his people. And now we give you thanks for your blessing on this house of prayer, where through your grace we offer you the sacrifice of praise and are built by your spirit into a temple made without hands, even the body of your son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying,
Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. As this broken bread was once many grains which we have gathered together and made one bread, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom.
the gifts of God for the people of God, come let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. O God, whose church on earth is a sign of your heavenly peace, an image of the new and eternal Jerusalem, grant to us in the days of our pilgrimage that, fed with the loving bread of heaven and united in the body of your Son, we may be the temple of your presence, the place of your glory on earth and a sign of your peace in the world. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your spirit. Christ, whose glory is in the heavens, fill this house and illuminate your hearts and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.